to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your Peptide Buddy. Today's video will likely be a bit ridiculous, and that's because we're going to review all the peptides we discussed over the past year. Over 30 to be exact. And for those of you who've seen this channel before, watch my videos, you know I'm way too long-winded to concisely discuss all the clinical data and use case scenarios, research and development, and risks of all of these different compounds in a brief period of time. But that's exactly what we're going to do. Talk about each of these peptides in three or four sentences or less, and to be frank, it was tough. So I'll reinforce the point that if you want the legitimate full breakdowns of these peptides, go to my channel, search through the playlists, and we'll tour through the research together. But for those of you who want a little overview, I've condensed a year's worth of research into this video and I hope you enjoy. So let's jump right in. As we know immensely well by now, the growth hormone releasing pathway involves multiple components, with stimulatory and inhibitory factors as well. Growth hormone releasing hormones secreted from the hypothalamus, signaling release of growth hormone from the anterior pituitary, and subsequently release of IGF-1 predominantly in the liver, which therein goes on and performs the tasks we typically attribute to growth hormone. Influence on bone, muscle, tissue, other things as well. Ghrelin is typically known as the hunger hormone in great part secreted by cells of the stomach. It's stimulatory towards this pathway, while another hormone called somatostatin is inhibitory or would feed back and tell the growth hormone releasing hormone pathway essentially to slow its role. Sermorolin, tesamorolin, and CJC1295 are all GHRH analogs, growth hormone releasing hormone, i.e. they act like this hormone itself, binding receptors on the anterior pituitary to increase release of growth hormone. These compounds aren't identical, however they're all pretty structurally similar. Of the three, tesamorolin is FDA approved for lipodystrophy in patients suffering from HIV and is clinically prescribed for such at an exorbitant cost. Given its novelty as the patent for agrifta, the product expires in 2039. Somorolin used to have more of a clinical presence previously being used to manage growth hormone deficiency in children, not so much so anymore, and although maintained FDA approval, at one point clinical utility of this peptide was ultimately disbanded not due to reasons of safety or efficacy, so likely financial incentive or lack of financial benefit from the drug's production. CJC1295, on the other hand, is a bit different because in its compounding, the developers at Conjichem linked a drug affinity complex to the peptide, which in its DAC form significantly prolongs its half-life, from a compound whose half-life would likely sit sub-30 minutes to about 6 to 8 days. Now, although this technology is interesting and unique, it's important to keep in mind that significantly sustaining growth hormone release likely predisposes to increased duration of side effects if it's intolerable. As we make our way down the growth hormone releasing pathway, there sit multiple peptides that act on the ghrelin or growth hormone secreting gog receptor to stimulate release of growth hormone. These peptides, which are pretty similar, include ipamorelin, hexarelin, GHRP2, GHRP6, and we actually did a whole video comparing their clinical research and pharmacokinetic profile, including half-life and potency. But to sum it up, the most potent of the peptides in this class is hexarelin, followed by GHRP2, and then GHRP6, and then uh, likely ipamorelin. Ibutamarin, or MK677, isn't technically a peptide, which is why I didn't include it just right before this, but it acts very similar to those we just mentioned, stimulating the same receptor, leading to increased release of growth hormone and subsequently IGF-1. And although it's less potent than hexarelin, given its prolonged half-life and duration of action, would likely be longer. And all these compounds, the ones most clinically evaluated in modern times, is ibutamarin for growth hormone deficiency, which will be made clear if you look at the pipeline of a company called Lumos Pharmaceuticals. So of all the ones we just listed in this similar class, however, it's likely there will be decent stimulation of appetite, with ipamorelin being notably the most neutral of the GHRPs. So we're continuing to move along to IGF-1, the downstream product of this pathway, which inspired creation of peptides like IGF-1, LR3, and DES-1-3 to IGF-1. Peptides I personally would in touch and ones we've done deep dives on previously too. But in a nutshell, their differences lie in pharmacokinetic profile for the most part. LR3 is a longer peptide with a likely significantly longer half-life, 
perhaps even as long as 20 to 30 hours. DES or DES is truncated, shorter acting, and a more potent analog of IGF-1. So while we're on the topic of growth hormone secretagogues, AOD-9604 is something I and others in the space have covered before. It's crafted from what's considered to be the lipolytic segment of growth hormone itself, i.e. hypothesized to be the fragment of GH responsible for burning fat, if you will. It's very similar to another peptide called fragment 176 to 191, both of which have research and anecdote alike that are generally unconvincing and sparse. Cerebral license, Selang, and Samax are what come to mind when we think of the cognitive enhancing nootropic type peptides. Cerebral license is essentially an undisclosed concoction of neurotrophic factors touted to be involved with neurorecovery and neuroplasticity, while Samax is a heptapeptide derived from the structure of ACTH, or adrenocorticotropic hormone, and Selang, on the other hand, is an analog of an endogenous peptide called Tufsin. Samax, like cerebrolysin, is more thought to be in line with modulating neurotransmitter activity, such as that regarding brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, which is implicated in synaptogenesis and mood. Selang, on the other hand, is thought to be more anxiolytic, with minimal data suggesting a role in neurotrophic factor expression as well. All in all, access to human data among these three is lacking, with Samax's impression on me appearing the most promising in the context of post-drug recovery, and Selank possibly possessing anti-anxiety properties without the human research to really show for it at this point. Cavinson peptides are also known as bioregulators. They were developed by Dr. Vladimir Cavinson, rest in peace, to help counteract the aging processes. These short peptides, typically like three to four amino acids, are derived from specific organ systems and are intended to promote recovery and enhance immunity, as well as delay age-related functional decline in these targeted organs. Examples include epitalon based on epithalamin, testogen, cardiogen, and others. Take most organs, add a gen to it, and there you go. You'll find full videos on many of these peptides on the main YouTube channel and on the Patreon alike. So this is a good time to pause real briefly and ask that if you're still watching and enjoy this peptide-focused content, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. It goes a long way and I appreciate you all for it. I know some people like to compile their findings and sell them to the public in like a little book for 1997 or something like that, but to hell with that. The community is what I'm here for and I appreciate the support. Thanks again. Now, DSIP, or Delta Sleep Inducing Peptide. It's thought to modulate, well, duh, sleep. Despite its name, research shows mixed results, with some studies even suggesting it could affect REM sleep rather than delta sleep. There's a lack of consistent data, and even when effects are observed for that matter, they're often minimal or inconclusive. While some people report benefits, the evidence doesn't support strongly DSIP as a reliable sleep enhancer or sleep aid at this point. Moving on. Lately, we've talked a lot about folistatins and their brother in SARMs, YK11, which are in intended to essentially lead to an onslaught of pure muscle. So as we know, cattle and other animals born with mutations impacting myostatin, which limits muscle mass, grow to become what appear to be absolute units, disinhibited muscle growth. Animal studies have shown increased muscle mass and strength with folistatins, and there was some promising data from a small trial with patients with Becker muscular dystrophy, but despite the hype and orphan drug status for inclusion body myositis, research on folistatins in humans is still very limited, and there are concerns about its safety and long-term effects. Moreover, the peptide's unclear connection to cancer and other diseases certainly raises important questions about its clinical use. Kiss peptin is something we've just touched on on the channel before, which quite frankly deserves a whole video, especially with all the TRT talk we've done lately. Kiss peptin is derived from the Kiss one gene, and it plays a key role thought to stimulate gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GnRH, the most upstream in the testosterone releasing pathway. While it's believed to have a potential to augment testosterone levels, some preclinical studies raise concerns that chronic use could actually lower testosterone. But I'd say at this point that's more like I said preclinical and speculative. But this highlights the complexity of its effects and calls for caution in long-term use, 
but stay tuned, let's just do an upcoming video on the topic in the near future. BPC-157 is easily the peptide we've spent the most time on on this channel discussing. It's a 15 amino acid pentadeca peptide derived from human gastric acid, which by this point I should just get tattooed on my scalp. But although there lies significant controversy in the peptide's legitimacy due to a singular author, Dr. Predrag Sikorich, inspiring the almost entire body of literature and research, its preclinical data shows curiosity and promise in the context of wound healing, gastrointestinal health, and post-injury recovery. That said, that's all the data really is at this point, preclinical, which leaves the question, will we ever get some more reliable human studies? Goodness, I hope so, but crazier things have happened. BPC-157 is oftentimes addressed alongside TB-500, which is a fragment of the more well-studied, larger endogenous compound called TB4, thymus and beta-4, which was initially discovered in the thymus but found to be more all-existing or ubiquitous. Although there exists data on the large TB4, there is a big paucity of research, especially in humans, on fragment TB500, which is theorized to enhance recovery in different contexts. However, if you watch my other videos on the topic, you'll see that there are certainly some reasons why I'm a bit concerned about this one in particular. All right, so the melanotans. Melanotan 1, melanotan 2, and PT141 all agonize different melanocortin receptors. They're thought to be involved with sunless skin tanning and libido enhancement. I'll say of the three, MT1 is the most investigated and most clinically promising, gaining FDA approval in its brand form called Sines for increasing pain-free light exposure in patients with a terribly uncomfortable condition called erythropoietic protoporphyria, where skin exposed to sunlight leads to pain and alterations of the skin itself. And although MT1 is linearly shaped and more closely resembles the structure of alpha melanocyte simulating hormone, MT2 is a cyclic and truncated version of MT1. Now, PT141, which came about after, is an analog to MT2 and thus resembles it closely. And as such, although research on MT2 was essentially disbanded due to erectile promoting qualities and a peptide intended for skin health combined with occurrence of unwanted sexual enhancement was what led research to PT-141, which is currently FDA approved as Vilesi for hypoactive sexual desire disorder in premenopausal women. GHKCU or GHK copper is a naturally occurring tripeptide bound to copper extensively studied by Dr. Lauren Pickard for its regenerative and anti-inflammatory properties. It's been linked to improvements in neuronal health, skin appearance, thickness and density, and of particular interest, especially to me, GHK CU is considered a potential modulator of genetic expression, with promising implications for reversing aspects of aging and mitigating the effects of certain medical conditions. However, this promise, or at this point, is just that promise, and an important consideration for future research. And somewhat similarly, the popularly promoted collagen peptides are used in different cosmetic agents to improve features of skin aging, understandably so, as their short change of amino acids derived from collagen, a structural protein critical for maintaining maintaining skin elasticity, joint health, and connective tissue integrity. Now let's get into the health of the powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondria, which has become a meme at this point. SS31 is an interesting peptide to me, thought to entangle itself within mitochondrial health and stability. It's also called alamipratide, and it's a mitochondrial peptide discovered accidentally during research on synthetic opioids. It targets cardiolipin on the inner mitochondrial membrane, acting as an antioxidant and protecting mitochondria mitochondrial function. Animal studies show it can boost energy production, reduce oxidative stress, and possibly prevent muscle loss with some applications towards recovery and metabolic health. Human trials have explored its use in macular degeneration, heart failure, and mitochondrial myopathy with mixed but intriguing results and mild side effects. While there's still a lot to uncover about this one regarding safety, long-term potential, and different clinical uses, SS31 is one of the more fascinating peptides for me, especially in the realm of mitochondrial dysfunction. FOXO4, aka FOXO4-DRI, aka Proxifim, aka the FOX peptide, has caught people's attention because it's linked to cellular senescence, basically the aging and death of cells. Now, FOXO4 is a protein, it's part of the 4 box family, which helps regulate things like 
like oxidative stress, cell death, apoptosis, and muscle homeostasis. It's expressed in tissues like muscle, brain, and skin, and is involved in both suppressing tumors and potentially promoting them, depending on the context. FOXO4 DRI was created to disrupt the binding between FOXO4 and P53, a tumor suppressor protein, to promote apoptosis in senescent cells, making it a senolytic peptide. Studies in rodents show promising results in cancer, muscle loss, and age-related diseases with improvements in tumor radiosensitivity, muscle regeneration, and even organ protection in some instances. However, there's still a lot of unknowns, especially in the cancer-promoting or suppressing effects, and there's really no human data yet, so something to certainly keep an eye on, interesting nonetheless. ARA290, also known as sibenatide, is an 11 amino acid peptide derived from erythropoietin, or EPO, designed to target the IRR, which is the innate repair receptor, promoting tissue recovery and anti-inflammatory effects without directly affecting the EPO receptor. It's been studied in conditions like diabetic neuropathy, sarcoidosis, and multi-organ failure, showing promising results in pain relief and tissue regeneration, particularly in the cornea. While it's earned orphan drug status for treating sarcoidosis-related neuropathic pain and small trials suggest its safety and efficacy, the long-term effects remain uncertain, particularly regarding cancer risks. Despite these concerns, ARA290 has demonstrated potential as a therapeutic tool for chronic pain and inflammation, though more research is needed, and this is one that's going to be on my list of things to keep an eye on. Actually, all of these are. Who am I kidding? MOTC is a mitochondrial-derived peptide known as a quote-unquote exercise mimetic, or thought to create a physiological response similar to that of exercise. Rodent studies show its potential to reduce fat accumulation, improve physical performance, and counteract metabolic dysfunctions like obesity and insulin resistance. In humans, early research suggests it might help with metabolic syndrome and aging-related issues, though more studies are needed to solidify these findings. I don't need to spend too much time on the GLP-1 agonists because they're more popular than most celebrities, semaglutide and the like. GLP-1 agonists that improve metabolic risk metrics and suppress appetite subsequently lead to weight changes via increased insulin release, decreased glucagon release, and slowed gastric emptying. Terzepatide's essentially semaglutide with a slight twist because it also agonizes GIP receptors or glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. And retitrutide, as we just discussed on the main channel and Patreon, also agonizes glucagon receptors, which although we don't know why exactly this is helpful, the benefit the benefit of such is thought to lie in energy expenditure and homeostasis. Alright folks, so we're almost there. Adipatide is formally known as prohibitin targeting peptide 1, or even FTPP as fat targeting apoptotic peptide, which describes its goal of triggering programmed cell death in adipocytes or fat cells, making it a pro-apoptotic drug. Although initially hyped to the ceiling in mid-2010s, its research suddenly halted by choice of the investigators involved, and since its public face in the public public limelight hasn't been the same, it's certainly not known as the safest peptide, with a high incidence of renal injury, which people would already be at increased risk for with conditions like obesity and type 2 diabetes, not to mention the GLP-1 market and hype has apparently conquered the world at this point. There you go, over 30 peptides and I don't know how many minutes actually I wrote the script before recording the video. Regardless, I'm going to take a deep breath now. I hope you enjoyed this video and that it didn't push you to sleep. I know it's not my typical deep dive, but this is my attempt at a less deep dive, a shallow one, and I hope I didn't bang my head on the pool flooring. Regardless, thank you so much for watching. If you want more videos like this in the future, leave a comment, a like, a subscribe if you will. And if you're looking for a way to further support the channel, the details to the Patreon will be in the description below. As always, thank you for watching and have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based, pull up a chair, let's get this straight, peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.